suppose we can get started. I'm Ruben, if you haven't met me before. I'm taking over Craig's class for today while he's on holidays. Um, so just to start off, uh, let's pray and then we'll get into it. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your word. We thank you for its encouragement. We thank you for um, the wisdom that's contained in it. Uh, we thank you that, uh, first of all, you've given us the gospel. Uh, you have you have saved us from our sin. You've given us Christ to be the perfect substitute for us. And then you've given us the Spirit so that we can go out and proclaim your gospel. Um, I pray that uh, your words will be spoken today, and uh, this will be an encouragement to everyone here. I uh, pray these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, so I'll start off with an example from, from the book of Matthew, Matthew 14, 26 to 31. Um, and it's a, it's a very familiar story. I'll just read it, read it for you. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? So as this, this lesson is about overcoming fear, um, we need to, to learn the reasons why we, why we fear. So the, Peter, when he was looking to Christ, he could, he could see um, what he needed to do. And that led to his boldness to actually step out of the boat. But as soon as he took his eyes off Christ, um, when he looked at the, the wind and the waves and the surroundings, the circumstances that he was in, um, that led to, to fear. And he was no longer confident. He was no longer confident to actually do what he was already doing. He was already walking on the water. He was already going to Christ. But he was... I don't know how far he got, but <laughs> he could have been halfway there and the boat's already back there. And it's like, hang on a minute, I don't have that safety net of the boat, but he's already walking on water. So just to, to begin with, uh, Peter looked to Christ and he was bold to, to step out. Um, and that's what we're meant to do. Whereas when he looked at the waves and the, and the wind, um, that leads to fear. So it's as soon as we take our eyes off Christ that, that we start to fear. So I've got some, some reasons uh, that we as Christians may fear uh, when we're presenting or sharing Christ. Um, and I've got, I've got four here, but I'm wondering if, um, if people here can actually guess what they are. Or, I mean, there are, there are many reasons, but um, there are four that, that I could really think of. Um, what are some fears that that you come across when you're uh, wanting to present the gospel to people? Confrontation. Yeah? So what does that, that boil down to? So when you share that they're going to retaliate either aggressively or in some other way. So ultimately that could be the fear of man? Yep. 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 So that was my first one, the fear of man um, and what, what they could do. Any others? Fear. Fear of failure. Yep. I've got that one as well. That was my fourth one. Um, and it's a fear of no results, fear of failure. So even you could do all the right things, uh, but nothing comes of it. Um, yep. That's one of the fears. Uh, any others? Rejection. Yep. Yep. I think that still comes under the fear of man, but yeah, that's, that's valid. So fear of our ability, 
Yep, I've got that one, the fear of our abilities. So not being good enough, uh, not having the right skill set or not having uh, the right abilities to actually carry it out. And I've got one more as well. And I've got that as the fear of misrepresenting God. So not actually saying the right things. So things that actually contradict uh, what the gospel is. Um, and we should know the gospel because we've been in this class and we've been talking about it for, for six weeks now. But it's the fear of misrepresenting God. You don't want to say anything because you don't want to get it wrong. So I've got fear of man, uh, fear of our abilities, fear of misrepresenting, and the fear of failure. So then when we think about these fears biblically, uh, there are certain things in the Bible that we hear about uh, that are remedies to those fears. So they, they counteract those fears. Uh, and I've got them listed here. Uh, the first one is to fear and to trust God uh, rather than fearing men. Um, so if the remedy to, to fearing men is actually to fear God. But the remedy to fearing man is also to trust God. Uh, so those two things happen, need to happen simultaneously. Uh, and I've got uh, Psalm uh, 56 mentioned here. Uh, and it's the Psalm of David. And essentially, he, there are two verses where he says, In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? And then in another verse, he says, What can man do to me? So ultimately, he's looking at God as the one who is sovereign, and even though he's in this tremendous conflict, um, as we know, David's often in conflict, um, he's saying, what can man do to me? What can flesh do to me? So in comparison to God, uh, it doesn't compare. Um, and this echoes Jesus' own teaching, um, and this is, this is number, or B, um, about fear, because he tells us to fear God, uh, who has the authority over the soul, rather than man who has the authority over only the body. Um, and that's, that's in, in Matthew 10, 28, and also in Luke 12, 4. So the last one um, is also an accurate view of ourselves and an accurate high view of God and who he is. And we've been talking about that in this class um, as, as we've been going through the gospel. It's knowing really who God is and knowing who we are. Um, I just want to point out um, a few things about John the Baptist, about how he thinks um, the Messiah is and who he thinks Christ is, um, and how that is something that we should do as well. And we've just gone through this passage in, in my Bible study, so people in my Bible study should know as well. So Mark 1, 7 says, And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. So even, even that verse, um, it's saying that um, even the lowest task of any servant to possibly do, which is to, to undie, untie someone's sandals. Um, and in, even in that culture, the, the Jewish servants wouldn't even do that task. Um, so even their own people wouldn't do that. But the, the Gentile servants who were in their household might do that. Um, so John's saying, I'm not even worthy to be called God's people or to be in his presence because of, of who he is. Um, and that's, that's the, the view that we're meant to take because we are sinful. Uh, but by God's grace, um, we are 
we've been saved. So when we're meant to think of ourselves in that way, that we're not worthy, um, nothing that other people do to us is, is unwarranted because ultimately we deserve the worst because we are the vilest of sinners because we've rejected a holy God. Anything that happens is, is actually so much better than we deserve. Um, and then in John 3, 3.30, uh, it's simply John the Baptist saying, he must increase, but I must decrease. So it's saying the glory of God must increase, um, and whatever is counted to me uh, shall, shall decrease. Um, so this is specifically talking about uh, John the Baptist's ministry and allowing Jesus' ministry to, to take over. Um, but it's something that, that we should view as a remedy to the fear of man, saying it's not about me, it's not about uh, their retaliation onto me, it's not about their rejection of me, um, it's about ultimately their rejection of God. Um, so you have, kind of have to take yourself out of the equation um, and saying it's the message that I preach and it doesn't matter what happens to me, whether good or bad, um, it's about Christ. So that's the, the first remedy. Uh, the remedy to the fear of man is to, to fear and to trust God. Uh, and then the next one, so the remedy to the fear of our ability, so not being good enough, is to trust in God's abilities, not our own. So there's a couple of really good examples, and I'll pick one up from the book of Exodus. Uh, turn to Exodus 3. So this is Moses at the burning bush. So he's already 80 years old at this point. He's uh, escaped from Egypt. He's been in the land of Midian for 40 years, and he encounters this burning bush, um, which we know. Um, and then there are a few distinctives about how, how he does this, or how he, how he goes about things. So we've got 3.13 to 4.17. Maybe I won't read it all. It's quite long. So 3.13 says... Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, uh, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So already he has sent, said that the God of the the fathers is coming to them. So he's already got that commission to, and, and the authority. Um, and then it continues on. And then in verse uh, 1 of chapter 4, Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. So he's already discounting the authority of God. He's already fearing, well, they won't believe me. They won't believe the words that I say. Uh, and then uh, in verse 10 of chapter 4. And this is again as after God has encouraged him about how he will uh, give him signs to do uh, and wonders to make them believe um, because he made his, his hand leprous. And then he made it clean again. Uh, but then Moses says again to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent either in speech in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. So there he's actually revealing his own inability or lack of abilities uh, to do what he needs to do. Uh, but then it all kind of leads to, to verse 13 where he says, but he said, oh my Lord, please send someone else. Uh, so all this time, 
Moses was saying, I'm not good enough. I can't do this. I can't even speak well. I haven't even been speaking well to you when you're in this burning bush and I can't even see you. Um, Moses knows his own weakness um, and, and God encouraged him up until the point where he said, no, send someone else. This isn't for me. You're, you haven't chosen the right person. And it was only at that point that God was angered and he said, no, I am sending you. <laughs> you are going to do this. Um, because he gave them all the, the encouragement, all the abilities from God, not from Moses, to do these things. He even gave him Aaron to go alongside him, to speak with him. Um, so, yeah, Moses knew his weaknesses. God also knew Moses' weaknesses and was able to, to counter, them, counter them when they were brought up. Um, so what this shows is that, that God's strength overcomes our weaknesses. But what we can't do is shy away from the command and actually refuse to go, uh, because that's when we're actually disobeying God and um, not living according to his what he's called us to do. Um, but God provided all the means for him to, to go to, uh, to Egypt and to go to Pharaoh and ultimately lead the people out. It wasn't because Moses was anyone special. It was because God had chosen him. So another example that we've got uh, is the example of Paul um, in 2 Corinthians. Uh, so when Paul's talking about Second uh, Corinthians. He's essentially defending his apostleship, his authority to teach uh, to the Corinthians. He explains in, in quite detail the lengths that he's gone to, to proclaim the gospel. And at one point he even says, I'm speaking like a madman <laughs> because he's boasting in his weaknesses. So he says uh, in 11.30 uh, of 2 Corinthians, If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. So Paul is even saying that it's not about what strength I have. It's not about what abilities I have. It's about what abilities God has and what strength that he has and then uses me to do. Um, and then in, in chapter 12, he talks about the, the thorn in his side, and it's a, it shows that he's not powerful. He can't get rid of all the things that, that pain him. Um, but then in 12 verse uh, 7 to 10, he says, So to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So Paul's recognizing that, again, he's got no power in and of himself. He sees that the power comes from Christ. The power comes from God. And he's completely different to the, the super apostles that, that he denounces um, in this letter, um, because he actually boasts in his weaknesses. And he knows that he also uses the, the weak, the things that are weak, to shame the strong. And he says that in 1 Corinthians 1, 27. And to show that that's God who is actually doing the work, not the people who are working. It's always God. So that's our remedy to our own abilities or not being able, not thinking we're good enough. Um, it's always that God is good enough. The message is, is good enough. We will never be good enough. Uh, 
So another, another remedy to those fears is we need to trust in God's sovereignty in salvation. So God knows who are his. He has his sheep and they know his voice. Uh, it's John 10, 3 and 4. Um, there's nothing that we can do that can stop people who he has chosen from coming to Christ. There is nothing we can do to actually hinder that. Uh, we can be a part of God's work to bring them to Christ, um, and he can allow us to do that. But God has determined a certain way that people will come to Christ. Um, and that will happen regardless. It's our privilege whether we are a part of that or not. Um, and then uh, to go on from that, Romans 8, uh, 29 and 30 uh, talks about this, this golden chain of salvation. Uh, so those who are called... Those who are called according to his purpose. Uh, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, uh, in order that he might be the first more born among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So this is the golden chain of salvation that, that cannot be broken. Uh, there are certain people that have been predestined. There are certain people that have been called. Um, each chain along this line, each link, uh, cannot be broken. Uh, so those whom he has chosen from the beginning... Uh, will in the end be glorified. Um, and there's nothing in heaven or hell or authorities and powers that can separate us from the love of Christ, um, even, even us. Um, and that's at the end of the chapter. But we cannot bro- break that chain. We cannot hinder that chain. So uh, in terms of misrepresenting God or not saying the right things or thinking, I, I think I actually put that person further away from God. Um, God is sovereign. So we have to trust in God's sovereignty. Um, and that eliminates our fear because, yes, we still have to be obedient, but we don't have to worry about the results. The results are God's. Um, and the word of God will not return void. So God will always achieve his purposes. Uh, it says that in in Isaiah 55, 11. Um, if God says he's going to do something, um, just like he said in Romans 8, he is going to fulfill that. And we, we have to trust who God is and what he has said, um, because that is sure. Um, if we can't trust God, there is no one to trust. Um, so we trust in him and, and what his word, word says to us. So the next one there is the we need to trust in the sufficiency of the gospel as the message to save. So we're trusting in the the sufficiency of the gospel. So go back to to Paul in in 1 Corinthians. He's he's great at boasting in his own weakness, but he also boasts in in the one thing that counts. Uh, so 1, 1 Corinthians 1.11 says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So he's essentially saying that the power is in the cross. The power is not in the words that I say. I don't need to present it um, the same way that the, the Greeks have been presenting their religious arguments for, for many years, uh, they need to trust in the cross of Christ. Um, and then in chapter 2, verse 2, again he says, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So again, highlighting the fact that the gospel doesn't need to be complicated. It doesn't need to be 10 steps here to here, you you need to know all these 10 things in this amount of detail in order to be saved. You need to know in 
the cross of Christ, what Jesus has done for you. You need to know why that needed to happen. You need to know who God is for that our sin to be real and then what Christ did uh, and then we respond to that. It doesn't need to be complicated. It needs to be simple so that we boast again in Christ's power and what he has done rather than the words or thinking that we ourselves are actually persuading anyone. It's the work of Christ persuading them. It's the Spirit working in them. Uh, And then the last one, the last remedy to those fears is we need to trust in God's command. So we can save no one by our own power, our own wisdom, or our own words. Um, The power only comes through God. Uh, And again, in 1 Corinthians, uh, this time chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, he says, What then is Apollos? What then is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So Paul again, he's saying, it doesn't matter who has worked in your life. Ultimately, it is God who has actually worked in your life. Um, These people have just been a part of that. They've had the privilege of participating in that journey toward, toward faith. Um, And then the real trust in God's command is knowing what success is in evangelism. Um, So success is not seeing people come to Christ. Although that's a wonderful thing that we see, um, and it's a blessing to see people come to Christ, that's not what defines success. Um, What we actually need to know is that it's, obedience to God's command and it's being obedient to that call to proclaim Christ to share the gospel and I've just got the reference uh, Romans 10 uh, 14 and 15 here which says how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed and how are they to believe of whom they have never heard and how are they to hear without someone preaching And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So again, highlighting that we need to go. And God has commanded us to go. No one can hear without people being sent. Um, And that's God's command, that we are to to preach the gospel. So there are remedies to the fears. um, But I've got a, a couple of ultimate remedies to fears. Um, not just in in evangelism, but also in in other areas of life, um, and these these are both taken from from Philippians. Uh, so Philippians three, uh, thirteen and fourteen, and then then verse twenty says, "Brothers, I do not consider that I have made uh, the resurrection from the dead my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining to what lies ahead." I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ Jesus. And then verse 20, But our citizenship is in heaven, and in, from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So one of the ultimate remedies of to fear and anxiety is to be heavenly minded, to be thinking eternally, to have that eternal perspective. It's not about what happens here. Um, It's about what happens um, in heaven. And then another ultimate remedy to to fear and anxiety uh, comes from Philippians 4, uh, 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So this is to be prayerfully minded, to actually give those things to Christ and to let everything pass through. Uh, the illustration that I used in, in uh, my Bible study when I was teaching this is the God's, it goes through the God filter, the filter of God's sovereignty. Is this something that God hasn't seen? Is this God's something that 
God doesn't know about? Is this something that God isn't allowing to happen? Um, and just trusting again in his sovereignty and then praying um, with all thanksgiving to be thankful in what he has done already. Um, that's a great remedy to the fear and anxiety that, that we have. But then we move on to some specific reasons for our boldness. So first of all, we know our God. We know who he is. Um, I've only got a few points here, that he is sovereign, that he is gracious, that he is immutable, that he is unchangeable. But there are so many attributes of God that we know. We know who he is. He is trustworthy. He cannot deny who he is. He is who he is. He is the self-existent one. Um, that, is, that is a reason for boldness. We know exactly who our God is because he is revealed in Scripture. Next one is that we have a sure hope. Our hope is not something unknown, but it's something that has been fully realized in Christ. So Paul in uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 4 and 12, he says, Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. So the confidence that we have is through Christ. We have nothing of ourselves, but again, it's through Christ. And it's the sure hope. Because he says, since we have a sure hope, in verse 12, we are very bold. So we have that sure hope, the hope of salvation, the hope of Christ and what he has done. And that encourages us. And then in, in Romans uh, five, one to five, we have peace with God. Um, we no longer are at enmity with him. But again, it's, it's a chain of things uh, that, that Paul puts in. Um, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that our suffering, that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into the hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I can't say it better than Paul, so I can <laughs> leave it at that. <laughs> but that does lead into our next, our next reason for boldness. Um, we have the Spirit of God in us. The Holy Spirit is, is living in us, and He, um, as Ephesians 6 says, he gives us the words to speak boldly. Yeah. Ephesians 6, 18 to 20. Uh, Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So Paul's directly saying that it's the spirit and people praying for him that can enable the spirit to work in his life and his ministry to enable him to give us the words um, to speak boldly. Um, and we can, we can pray those same things we can trust in that same spirit that was in Paul, and we can trust in the church that, uh, that we have around us, like Paul did in the church that he was writing to, uh, to pray for us and to, to uphold us in prayer. And one really um, good place to do that is in our life groups um, because we have that, that tighter circle and um, we should be praying for each other, um, especially in our opportunities for evangelism as well. <coughs> 
Um, and then in, in 2 Timothy 1, uh, 7 to 8, Paul says that uh, the spirit that was given to Timothy is not a spirit of timidity or a spirit of fear, uh, but a spirit of boldness. That was the Reuben revised version. What does it say? Yeah, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. And because of that, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. So again, saying that the spirit that's been given to us is not uh, something that uh, should cause us to have more fear, but it should cause us to be more bold in what we do. Uh, running out of time, but we'll, uh, we'll go to number four. We don't know how God will use us or work. We don't know how God works uh, or will work. Uh, he is able to do far more abundantly than all than we ask or think, as it says in Ephesians 3.20. Uh, and even the things that seem to hinder the gospel actually serve to advance the gospel. Uh, so we see that in Philippians 1, where Paul's saying that my imprisonment is for the advance of the gospel. Uh, or in Acts, at the end of Acts 7, the start of Acts 8, just after Stephen's been martyred, um, you would have thought that this is the worst thing that happened to the gospel, the proponents of the gospel being murdered. But it was because of that that the gospel went out from Jerusalem and spread even further, um, I would, I would think that the disciples didn't think that that would happen. I don't think they would have thought, "Ah, oh, we should go get martyred so that the gospel spreads." Uh, but it happened, and because of Stephen's martyrdom um, and Paul's persecution, it actually sent out much further than they than they anticipated. But it fulfilled what what God had commanded saying all Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It made that, um, all the persecution made that, that happen. Um, another reason for boldness is that we have only come to know God through others preaching. So it's only because of others sharing the gospel with us, um, whether in church or in the home or, or somewhere else, um, that we have... Um, be, become to know Christ, come to know Christ at all. Uh, it's only through God empowering others to preach, to minister and share the gospel that anyone is saved. And then it's the love of Christ that, that controls us, that compels us to persuade others, um, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, so I've got another illustration just to reinforce what we're to trust in. Um, so there's, I've heard this illustration before, so I hope I don't butcher it, but there's, there's a, a frozen lake. Um, and imagine that you're, you're walking out onto the lake. You can walk out in, in two ways, um, but ultimately it doesn't matter how you walk out. You could walk out boldly or you could walk out timidly. Um, one step at a time being slow, or you could run and jump and ice skate as soon as you get on. Um, but that ultimately doesn't matter. What matters is actually how thick the ice is. So how it matters where you're placing your foot. It matters where you've got your faith. Um, and we have our faith in the solid rock. We have our faith in Christ. Um, and he's unchanging. He's not going to let our foot fall. Um, we have trust in him so we can go out boldly because we know um, that that foundation is secure. And then a couple of final things. Um, so the, I've, I've labeled this the final word because we've got the final word from Paul to Timothy and then we've got the final word uh, to the disciples from Jesus. So in, in 2 Timothy 4, it's the last chapter of the Bible that, that Paul wrote. He charges Timothy to preach the word be ready in season and out of season to reprove, rebuke, and exhort 
with complete patience and teaching. Uh, and this is just after he has encouraged him in the sufficiency of Scripture, which equips him for every good work. Then Paul goes on to describe how there will be many who will not listen and they'll wander from, from the truth, God's teaching. And then he says, As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Although this is a specific command to Timothy, um, it's also a clear command to us, um, especially considering 2 Corinthians 5, um, where Paul's talking about the ministry of reconciliation that has been given to us as well. We have been given the the ministry um, that Timothy was given to bring others to Christ. Um, So Paul's second letter to Timothy is essentially the the basics. It's, It's Paul's legacy that he wants Timothy to continue on. Um, it's what he really needs to remember and Paul won't have another chance to tell him so he really wants these things to be remembered and this is the the final chapter these are the things that it boils down to and it matches exactly um, what Jesus says to the disciples when he says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It is Christ's authority and his Spirit that equips us for evangelism, just as the Scripture does, um, because it's, it's Christ's word that is Scripture. Uh, Just as Paul was commanding uh, Timothy to do also in the work of an evangelist to preach the good news, so too Jesus was telling the disciples to tell others to obey Christ's command and to make disciples of all nations. So I've got those, those three things there for Timothy to remember and the disciples to remember, and that's what we're to remember. And that too gives us boldness and it can overcome our fear because it tells us what we rely on. And we rely on Christ, we rely on his word, and that equips us and allows us to speak boldly for Christ.